Alright, where this everyone? Is my solution to oh, my fellow complexity explorers. My solution to launch of the complexity challenges. The science of complex systems is about solving the challenges of the 21st century, whether that be terrorism, inequality, cities. And the complexity challenge is directly drawn from those challenges to then push onto a new group of up and coming complexity scholars. It's a unique opportunity for people from all over the world with various ideas and training to come together and try and solve the important problems. So the way Complexity Explorer relates to the Santa Fe Institute is really interesting. I think one of the things that makes it so exciting. The Santa Fe Institute by design is non-disciplinary. They've got lots of folks with lots of different backgrounds going at all these crazy problems that in an academic, a traditional academic institution, you'd have no business tackling, and certainly not as a group. And the same thing holds for Complexity Explorer. You've got lots of different people with lots of different backgrounds. They're drawn to that kind of non-disciplinarity. That's what makes the challenges so interesting. You've got a group of students that are coming at them with the same spirit as SFI as an institute. They want to be non-disciplinary. They want to create solutions that combine desperate ideas in new and interesting ways and potentially creating revolutionary solutions. So the ideal problem for a complexity challenge first has to be drawn from the real world. But once you do that, we want real world problems that not only apply to one specific situation, but can be applied to many. So for example, when we think about air transportation, trying to get planes from point A to B, well, that's also a problem if you want to get cars from A to B or packages in the warehouse from A to B. Or think about a problem of the flow of information and rumors in a network, which could influence some stock market or news cycles or anything like that. So the best problems we have come directly out of the real world, but in a sense that if we could solve that one, we might also solve a number of other problems. The challenge problems themselves are just as exciting as the students. They're very open-ended, and that lets the students combine ideas in new and interesting ways and just keep combining and keep combining and keep combining and building into these very novel ideas. And what's so interesting about that is that they, they take these very broad questions and then they have to start to create a research problem out of that and come up with the exact question and then an approach to answer it. And you get that very interesting sort of path dependency. And so these write-ups, you not only learn interesting ways of, of attacking a problem, you also learn an interesting way of even thinking about things in this space. And that is oftentimes just as useful as the solution they end up with at the end. So one of the really fun parts about the complexity challenge is actually trying to craft the problem for the students to tackle. Because you, know, you don't want to essentially presuppose a particular solution. You don't want to articulate a problem in such a way that you start to bias folks thinking about what the right way to attack it is. And so you know, what do you see when you look around the world these days and, and, and open a newspaper? Thing? It's all about you know, self-driving cars and packages being delivered by drones and all sorts of crazy things like that. And we started talking about these sorts of things and all the potential uses for autonomy, be they swarms of UAVs trying to locate a stranded hiker or uh, trying to automate more of our airspace or even trying to help package delivery companies deliver things more smoothly. The inspiration for the first challenge was this problem about getting goods, cars, airplanes from one place to another, but doing so in a very decentralized way that didn't have a lot of information requirements. Given that general challenge, we started to think about how could we abstract that, make it a relatively simple world where if we could solve that problem, we'd get insights into these more complicated problems. So what we started with was just thinking about a checkerboard, where checkers would appear at one side of the board and have a destination on the other side. Moreover, the checkers had to use very limited information about their surrounding area, but not about the entire board, and presumably a simple set of rules for how to move. 
Now, this problem is relatively straightforward if the checkers just have to go across the row and end up at the other point, but it gets more complicated if a checker up high has to get down low, while at the same time a checker down low has to get up high. Moreover, it gets even more complicated when we start to add more and more checkers coming in. And this checker system is a great setup because we have this notion of things arriving in different places, having to go to different places, and having to operate on only local information. So it's a nice abstraction. More importantly, it's an abstraction that works across a variety of fields or intellectual skills or abilities. If you're a physicist, you might think about this as sand falling through a river or something like that. An economist might think about how local markets can get goods from one place to another. All kinds of different fields can come into this problem with their own insights and thoughts of methods of how they can go about doing it. After formulating the question, we released it to the students. They had a 30-day period in which to work on it, at the end of which they had to give us a written paper along with a three-minute video describing their solution. At the end of the 30 days, we received a number of really interesting write-ups and videos. The great thing about these write-ups and videos was the diversity of ideas that came out across the different students. By and large, each student came up with unique ideas about how to move the checkers and even how to evaluate how well they were moving, what kind of statistics or what kind of observations to make, and how to do the analysis. It was really a remarkable diversity of ideas. So I was very excited to get a chance to finally start looking at some of these uh, solutions and, and the write-ups and the videos that, that were produced by all the students. And it, it was really fascinating, all of the ways they had chosen to go after this problem. And what really struck me initially was that some of them, well, actually all of, all of them, all of them actually, had some very similar uh, problems that they discovered. And that was coupling among the checkers as they moved from one side of the board to the other, which was fascinating. And I had not expected to see that. And yet, that's one of those interesting things. Now you're seeing what might be these very, very sort of universal characteristics of these sorts of systems, because we're implementing them in very different ways, and yet we're seeing common issues come up across the board, like coupling in this case, so essentially traffic jams. And so then the students had, each, each person came up with some rather unique ways of dealing with the coupling and with the traffic jams that would come up with the checkers as they'd all crash into each other trying to get from one side to the other. And that was just an absolutely fascinating initial impression from looking at these write-ups. When we designed this challenge, one thing we knew would be interesting is that when you got more and more checkers coming on one side of the board, that would eventually overload the system. And trying to deal with these overloads was quite important and has a lot of real-world consequences. One thing students realized is that there were these critical points in the system where if the arrival rate was low enough, we'd never see traffic jams. But if it moved just a little bit above that, the whole system would start to jam up. Moreover, the system would jam up in a particular pattern that appeared over and over across the different entries. A number of students tried to deal with this by taking whatever their simple movement rule was and modifying it, giving it different behavior when the jamming started to happen. So instead of always trying to head towards your goal, the rules would have checkers back up or try and take other routes or even stand still so other checkers could figure out how to move forward. So after the general impressions, there were some very interesting specific insights that came from the, the different papers that, that that, that we reviewed. So one individual used ASTAR, which is a very common path planning algorithm. And although they didn't have time in this particular challenge, that brought up a really interesting idea in my mind about how to deal with traffic when you've got autonomous vehicles. If they are in fact using ASTAR, now you can actually start to coordinate who's going to be going through which intersection at what time. And so now you could essentially, you could even imagine cars now negotiating with each other saying, I'm, I need to get through that intersection, I'm running late and that sort of thing. And so that we can actually be scheduling. And so traffic jams could, in some ways, maybe become a thing of the past, because now we're coordinating across larger geospatial scales, as opposed to everyone just cramming through an intersection as fast as they can. So that was particularly interesting. Someone else, and this was completely unique, 
actually used as part of their evaluation uh, mechanism, how computationally taxing the system was and how much computer time basically each agent needed to use to execute its rule set, which is also fascinating because of course, you know, when it comes to say drones, you're very hampered by batteries. And the more computation you gotta do, the more batteries you need, which makes you heavier, which makes it harder to fly. And so making sure that you're doing something that's also computationally very lightweight was fantastic. And that was completely unique and very interesting. For the first challenge, there are a lot of interesting ideas that came up through the various submissions. For example, one student explored how different levels of information impact the system. The interesting finding they had was that more information was not always better. They found this intermediate level of information that allowed the system to work well. Another student came up with very clever ideas for the movement algorithm. At one level, you could just think, well, just go in the right direction where you want to head. But of course, part of this problem was that checkers can collide. So this student had a nice way of forming super highways. And when checkers moved to a particular position, they would then take these highways to get to a very different place on the board. And then they came up with very interesting rules for how do you alleviate conflict among the checkers. So I, I'm hugely biased. My background is in anthropology and public affairs and law and computational social science. But I, st I, I still find this to be a critical component in what's gonna keep our society moving forward and keep us progressing technologically. And that's this notion of non-disciplinarity. And that is exemplified by the complexity challenge. So these students have gone through a series of classes and learned the basic techniques of complexity science. And that is enormously important. But what really drives it home, what will actually make them useful researchers for society is the challenge problem at the end because that's where they have to actually sit down with a blank sheet of paper in front of them and say, how on earth am I gonna tackle this problem? And they've gotta go through it step by step and say, okay, this thing's too broad to tackle as a whole. What are the key pieces? What are the research problems associated with them? What can I actually tackle? And what are the, what are the methods that I need to bring to bear to get the insights that I need for each component? And now how do I synthesize that into an overall insight? That's what's so important about these complexity challenges. The first challenge was done with a small pilot group of students, and we were pleasantly surprised with the kinds of work that the students were able to do in this new format with the help of the faculty and the mentors. We're now ready to scale up the project where we give the challenge to a much larger group of students. And all we can imagine is the new diversity and new insights that will come with that bigger group. The possibilities are endless. In conclusion. Okay, thank you for listening to the presentation. It's been great fun. And I really enjoyed the challenge.